Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pedaling Towards Innovation and High Accuracy GIS, a case study on the development of the Cave Creek Utilities GIS. My name is Dr. Nicholas Smolowski, and I will be uh, helping uh, my co-presenter talk to you today about his very exciting solution, uh, Phil Ponce. Uh, he is a, a principal engineer, a registered engineer, a co-owner and vice president of Engineering Mapping Solutions. He's also a AGIC, our Arizona Geographic Information Council board member. Uh, Phil and I have known each other for quite some time. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I work for the company Bad Elf. I'm their GIS Solutions Director. We sell GPS equipment, and I'm also faculty at Arizona State University. So again, welcome. Hopefully you're in the right place. Uh, for the next 30 minutes or so, Phil and I will be presenting to you on this really neat solution called Bike Rack. Uh, following the presentation, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to Phil or myself. Our emails are on the screen. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the presentation. So the agenda for today, we're gonna start with some factoids to give a good background on what's going on uh, for this project. We're gonna discuss the geospatial problem at hand. We're gonna talk about the custom uh, high accuracy GIS solution that we implemented uh, to solve the problem. We're gonna go through some analysis uh, and results to justify what we did to kind of talk through and show everybody out there what is possible. And we will end with Phil giving us some prophetic declarations uh, and like and, and answering any questions if possible. Like I said, you can always email us. Uh, virtual formats are a little different. You may be watching this on a recording, uh, but we are certainly open to talking. All right, so let's talk some factoids. Cave Creek was originally settled in 1870. As you can see in the image to your left, uh, the icon is sitting on the north side of the greater Phoenix area in uh, Arizona. We are a Southwest state and Cave Creek is one of the municipalities that circumnavigate uh, the main city Phoenix, our capital. Uh, Cave Creek or the town of Cave Creek is approximately 30 square miles. Uh, and the, the customer or the stakeholder we primarily worked with on this project was Cave Creek's water and sewer utility. Uh, the water and sewer utility services about 1600 households. So not a super huge municipality, but also not small. Uh, so this is the geographic location and the customer that we will be discussing. I mentioned earlier, uh, Phil works uh, for the company EMS, Engineering Mapping Solutions. Uh, his company was founded in 1995. So he's been doing this for quite some time and uh, honestly, if you've been around the Esri ecosystem for a while, I'm sure you've probably run across Phil. Phil I feel like Phil knows pretty much everybody. Um, originally, uh, when EMS was founded, they had an emphasis on working on databases, specifically wet utility databases uh, and custom software deployment. Uh, EMS, uh, before GIS was, you know, kind of the way, uh, you know, kind of in the position that it is now, uh, worked with a lot of uh, clients updating their CAD systems and actually bringing GIS functionality into them. For this project specifically, it started in 2019, and the goal was to build an accurate GIS that was functional, uh, functional scalable, and cost efficient for the town of Cave Creek. In 2020, um, doing some due diligence, uh, Phil brought in Bad Elf as some support and deployed the custom GIS in 2020. So this is kind of the background of the project. Like I said, Cave Creek, Arizona, we're right outside of Phoenix. EMS was the company working on it. Uh, our emphasis was creating a scalable GIS that was functional and cost efficient for the town. All right, Phil, could you talk to us a little bit about your challenges? And uh, thank you again for, for doing this presentation with me today. I'm glad to do it, Nick. I uh, appreciate uh, the intro and uh, let's keep going here, huh? The, uh, the, the town's challenge was, was mainly, hey, let's build a GIS. And so we have to start with the various data sources that were presented to us, including what you see here, engineering as built. We had some uh, sewer and water, water modeling projects that were done. And due to the fact that there wasn't a lot of good documentation, these were basically schematic in nature. Um, we came across some field markups. 
schematic drawings there in air quotes because some of these things were drawn on literally on napkins. And we started considering then how best to do this. Um, we wanted to build all the data as best we could under a, a reasonable budget. So we, we initially threw out the concept of doing the traditional high cost uh, field survey data collection. So, you know, Sean Kurtzweiser is, is my client and you can see a quote here. We're reminded every day that when we look at this system, that the system is over 50 years old. It wasn't built to any municipal standards and literally, literally the wild west. If you come here to visit, most people are gonna go to Scottsdale. But if you truly want the flavor of the, the Wild West, come up to Cave Creek, Arizona. It is uh, rules were not all that well enforced and truly poorly documented. So those are the challenges we were up against, not unlike maybe some of the ones that you face, but uh, it certainly was there in, in Cave Creek. So how do we solve these solutions? The idea for us has always been create the, the best GIS we can from the ground up. As engineers, we always said that it's better to build it from the as-builts against an accurate land base than the traditional schematic GISs. Um, we followed behind that with data validation through observations uh, and GPS measurements. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. That's the crux of the presentation today. And of course, we threw at it uh, the, the newest and best GIS mapping software in the world, that is ESRI, and, uh, and their technology. So you can see the list. Uh, we started with the ARC map primarily. We're getting now into ARC Pro uh, when it comes to maintenance. The client is learning ARC Pro. Uh, we're leveraging ArcGIS online through our partners at the state in the AZ Geo Data Hub. Um, we have uh, field maps for ArcGIS, which is the replacement for collector. And we have uh, Nick helping us with the Bad Elf Flex. Add to that the fact that we're using uh, the GoPro viewer, uh, doing the GoPro Max with the 360 degree imagery, and we built an object viewer, and we'll show you some slides of that later. So here's the solution. Let's build as best we can with the documents that we have and fine tune the GIS with GPS measurements, both EMS as a, as a subcontractor, and now the client owns their own flex uh, unit that they can collect data with. Well, that's great, Phil. Thanks for uh, reviewing that with us. I Like you said, I think that's some pretty common challenges uh, we see in the geospatial industry. What I love about the solution EMS employed was the ability to collaborate between so many disparate technologies, hardwares, and softwares. Uh, it's, a it's a true attestment to your team's uh, development prowess. Uh, so why don't we talk a little bit, Phil? Um, we've got this slide here that says, one reality is all that matters. Um, can you maybe set us up for what you mean here and I can bring us home on this slide? Yeah, sure, Nick. Um, we've been doing this for quite some time, both of us. And you, you'll recall that, that when GIS first started, most people thought of GIS as an aerial map. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of the aerial maps back in the day were not that accurate. So all of a sudden, if we were to collect good GIS or good GPS data and overlay it on a suspect aerial, if the two don't match together, then people call into question the accuracy of the data. They don't necessarily call into the question the accuracy of the aerial. A lot of people kind of think of that as the, as the standard and then you know our data has to somehow match to it. So when we, when we say one reality, we, we try to make all of our data layers match so that they all look good together. And that's, that's what becomes reality, right? Absolutely. And so I can jump into more of the kind of geodetics here, kind of uh, the survey background in me. So in the 90s, Maricopa County, uh, the county that Phoenix and Cave Creek sits in, uh, they started putting out what are called GDACs. And these are monuments scattered throughout the uh, Valley of the Sun uh, that set the stage for creating this reality. And so this uh, Maricopa County surveying group uh, went out and laid uh, this foundational groundwork. 
from that, these GDAX built the parcel base. And so if you're all at all familiar with parcels, it's obviously a major jurisdictional boundary that we're concerned with when talking about people and cities and urban areas. And then additionally, as these imagery uh, were being flown uh, traditionally from aircraft or even satellites, the aerial imagery then fit to the GDAX, which fit to the parcels. And so what we had to do uh, for the town of Cave Creek was to noodle our way through this to understand what that reality was by Maricopa. And then as we collected new data, that the, the new data needed to match that reality. And I think the the, the kind of uh, the, 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 um, the, the connecting piece here, if you will, uh, would be the Bad Elf Flex, a high accuracy GNSS uh, unit. Uh, Bad Elf just happened to be used in this circumstance, but any high accuracy GNSS system out there on the market, uh, as long as it was performing at a, a survey grade reality, um, would be able to fit in there. So this is this is why the GIS was able to be created in the first place, reliable with high fidelity, because we had one geodetic reality uh, set by the by the county. This slide here talks about some of the methodology at a 30,000 foot view that um, Phil and his team worked through. I, I, I'll start off and I'll hand the torch to him. The one thing I want to immediately start with is the fact that the the FLEX, the GNSS, the Global Navigation Satellite System, is actually listening to satellites in space, GPS, GLONASS, Baidu, uh, and uh, Galileo, uh, and it's receiving these radio signals to get position. Additionally, in the state of Arizona, uh, Arizona Department of Transportation, ADOT, manages what's called the AZ Cores Network. This is a GPS correction system, terrestrial based, uh, that's uh, all throughout the Arizona area. You can sign up for free um, and get an account to that. And when you have the GPS then connected with a correction service, this is how we can get down to you know, one centimeter of accuracy or what we call survey grade or engineering grade, AKA we can meet the reality of Maricopa. And you can see there on the top left-hand corner, there's a 0.4 in the screen of the GPS uh, signifying 0.4 centimeters of accuracy. And so that is kind of where the bad elf piece comes in, but that's just a small, small part of all of this. The magic actually happens downstream. Phil, can you maybe talk to us about uh, once we're out of the GPS world, uh, what all you guys did to make sure that you were able to create a, a functional, scalable, uh, and long lasting GIS for Cave Creek? Sure, Nick. Um let me draw the attention first to the higher view. Uh, the three components that we've put in red there, we do the data collection, we do the data editing, and we do the data deploy. And again, preaching to the choir, that's, that's, that's no surprise there. The devil's in the details though, because it's very important on how you collect it. All the way down to, uh, Nick, Nick pointed out the bad elf and you see the RTCM3. There, there's, there's various things that we've gotta be mindful of is what datum that we're in. Uh, you know, the coordinate system. And so kind of blending all this together with Nick's expertise that he brought to the table, um, it's not, the good news is ESRI makes, makes this collection really easy, but it's very important, very important that we know what we're collecting. Um, you know, it's always been a fear of a lot of surveyors is that, that engineers like us get our hands on this stuff and we, we totally ma <laughs> mangle the data. So I've been forced to, to be somewhat of a, surveyor slash geodesist. I don't claim to be either, but Nick has helped quite a bit. The bottom line is, is that what comes out of the, when I hit the button on ESRI collector to say submit, it pushes a data point up to the AZ Geodata Hub. And there, there, therein lies the, the, the nice collaboration centerpiece that allows our editors then to come in with the ESRI software edit the GIS, which lives in a local geodatabase, and use the field information that was collected as, as the base. And the beauty of this is the fact that we have several people out there doing this, and you can contribute to the, the central hub in a multi-user fashion, and our editor editors actually can, uh, can consume it that way. And lastly then, once that data is nice and clean and the in the uh, geo database, it's pushed up to um, the EMS web map, or it can be pushed to 
the uh, ArcGIS Online Web App Builder, um, Web Map for for uh, the information of developers out there, all ESRI, JavaScript 3.x. We haven't gone to four. It's a little bit of a rewrite, but uh, yeah, we're using the JavaScript uh, 3. Oh, that's great. Um... I can quickly talk to this. The AZ Geo Data Hub is uh, this service, this collaborative piece that Phil was just talking about. This is actually run by the Arizona State Land Department, ASLD. Um, and you can see here some of the data, the track log data we're going to talk about when Phil went out to collect this um, information for the uh, town of Cave Creek. Uh, if you noticed in the uh, title of the presentation, we talked about pedaling, and we'll, we'll talk about what this yellow line actually is here in just a minute. But what I wanted to show you is these data are uh, in this collaborative framework, but also then hosted up to the EMS web map that... Um, that Phil was just mentioning there. Uh, Phil, anything else you want to talk about real quick on on these slides? Well, on the, the previous slide, I think you mentioned before you thought I was drunk, but it, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is what we do out there is a lot of hunt and peck. And you'll see that I backtrack and, and find information that, that I think should be out there. And that sometimes that requires me to go back and forth but what's really cool is you could see through my winding around out there at the end of the day makes a nice clean GIS at the back end. And that, that's really what we wanted to illustrate there. The next slide is interesting because it starts to speak to the, the actual way we did this collection. Uh, Nick, why don't, you, why don't you start with bike rack and I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with the, uh, the details. Absolutely. So uh, Phil uh, mentioned that I've often made fun of him because it looks like he's riding this bicycle around a little drunk, but he's not. Obviously, we follow all OSHA rules and standards and we are very, <laughs> very safe. Um, uh, this is a great technology to be socially distant and outside so you can be COVID free. Uh, it's sustainable uh, because you're actually using uh, what a colleague of mine calls burrito power, which is just, you know, arm and a leg power. But so this is this is Phil's solution. It's called Bike Rack and Rack standing for Rapid Asset Collection. And so what Phil was able to do is he took the Bad Elf Flex uh, he welded and mounted a, a survey pole to the front um, uh, wheel of this e-bike. He then attached a phone and a tablet, and you can't see it in this picture, but there's actually a GoPro 360 Max also attached. So just like how he used a whole bunch of different applications and softwares and databases to get this solution going, he's really linked a bunch of hardware together uh, and has developed this really neat uh, solution. Um, the eMotion e-bike uh, has an approximate eight hour range. And if you know anything about e-bikes, you, you actually have to pedal just a little bit, but then the battery will, will assist and actually help pedal you along. And so it's a really, really economical way to collect data. You've got a long uh, range of time uh, and you have all of these individual technologies wrapped together uh, for successful collection. And you can see obviously that um, Phil happens to be the technician here and he'll tell you that he loved it so much. He kicked his techs out and he ended up collecting all of this. I, I think him and his wife maybe we're riding around town together, but who knows? Uh, but they, you can see how he's literally rolled the front wheel, that axle over uh, the utility that he's collectioning, that that's a sewer, sewer manhole, right? And so the accuracy is there. You, he's collecting natively in a, a, a you know, centimeter grade uh, RTK GPS, and uh, he's got all of the equipment there to collect. And so what makes this such a fantastic solution is the fact that it can collect so much data so quickly and accurately. Phil, tell me about how amazing this thing was and how much data you were able to collect. Well, Nick, the, the numbers speak for themselves, right? Um, this was at the end of last year, as you can see. These are real numbers, real dates. And yeah, I was the one that started it out. My intent was to, uh, to get this pointed in the right direction to have my techs take over. But I got to tell you, it is a blast. I love riding out there. Um, it's, it, it, I just had so much fun um, doing it and, you know, who better to do it, right? If, if that's the case, I, I got in there and started logging all these numbers and you can see that uh, 
uh, let me draw your attention to points per hour, the fourth column over. I mean, my goodness, you can see there was times when we we're up north of in three digits, even one crazy day when I did was doing 176 points an hour. That was that was in a multifamily resident area where we were pretty, you know, the, the, everything was pretty tight. But the average there, we we're we're in a range of 80 to 90 points per hour, covering three to four miles per hour. And so it it is very efficient the way that we were doing this. And the client just the bang for the buck, they just love it. To this day, they love it. So I I was I was happy to do it and had a heck of a time doing it. That's awesome. And and Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were also collecting a ton of attributes at these points. You weren't simply just collecting a location. You were you were getting information about these assets, right? Right, right. The design we used in the collector, you go up to uh, to uh, the the map. And we created uh, download or uh, domain fields that allowed us to uh, do uh, drop downs. There's text fields. Uh, the, we, uh, yeah, there's a lot of information that got collected as part of that. And we continually honed our, our data form to make it faster and faster. Yes. That's awesome. And I think the number we threw out there, you were averaging about 80 points an hour when you totally looked at it. Here are some other images of uh, the bike rack. This time you can see the GoPro camera mounted on um, the system. You may ask, well, why would you want a GoPro camera? Well, um, and, and you also may ask, well, what do you do if you've got an asset that is not able to be ridden over? Well, and the, the answer to that would be, we're gonna use the 360 degree imagery here. We're gonna show you in just a minute. And Phil's gonna show you the, um, the software he put together where he is linking the GPS information, the collector information to this camera information has created his own uh, Google Earth light kind of pano viewer. So you can see there a couple images, uh, again, a couple more images to look at it. He's also adapted this. Uh, so if it's a longer haul and you're not able to ride a bicycle, you can say attach this to the top of your vehicle you can see the bike rack in the back and do virtually the same thing. This is the uh, the outline of where Phil rode around. He was certainly out there for a few days. I wonder if anybody was calling, uh, calling the police on him, hopefully not. But more importantly, and I think what really speaks to this story of success is all of the assets collected. And you can see there between valves and meters and hydro valves, hydrants, backflows, et cetera. It was a ton of information uh, and data collected for the town of Cave Creek. Um, you can see here a couple different things. Um, on the lower label, you see the Bad Elf track log. And so Phil had a tracking, like a breadcrumb tracking mechanism turned on for the flex. And so he is actually tracking everywhere uh, that the flex had gone uh, or he had gone. And then he also obviously collected those individual points. And you can see on the, the right side there, just an example, uh, not actively running, but art collector and how these points were being uh, taken from the field. He also had the ability to take individual photos out there. Um, but as we said, you're going to see how he tied in the panorama video. Here's another great example. You can see an individual photo on in the lower right hand corner. Um, but what I like to point out here is you, you may ask yourself, well, I think GoPros, GoPro Maxes have GPS built in. And you'd actually be right. Um, but what I want to point out here is that the track log uh, that you see there with the kind of salmon color triangles, that was the track log collected with a high accuracy survey grade GPS versus the GoPro integrated GPS, which looks even more squirrely. Uh, and you can see it is all over the place, which really is just an testament to it's good enough to kind of throw a photo down. But if you want to do anything more than knowing where the photo was, you're going to need a higher accuracy. I'm going to let Phil take it from here. But uh, this is a great example of what that GoPro imagery talks or looks like. Phil, can you talk to me a, a little bit about uh, your Google Earth Lite pano viewer and what you're currently developing with your pixel hunting? Sure, sure. So the, so the uh, developers in the room may recognize this photo as equilinear. It's a projection that the, the GoPro 360 collects. 
Uh, you could see that in the very left side, you could see most of my body there. And as you whip around to the right, you can see the other half of my body. And, and the photo is taken from two, two lenses and mathematically pulled together to what you see here. Now, what's cool about it is if you have the right kind of viewer, it becomes st street view like, I'll, I'll say that. Uh, this is our web viewer that is consuming those images and all of a sudden they look correct, but it allows you to pan and zoom as you, to your heart's content in the right. And then we have an inset of a, an ArcGIS map that tells you where you are in the direction that you're looking. Um, it, it's, it then becomes, and we're working on the, the, the most important part is putting in uh, LIDAR, but we don't have time to get into that. What, what Nick is showing here, though, is that the important step of triangulating between two known locations, the image on the left is lagging behind, the image on the upper right is, is one or two frames ahead, and the lower right shows where X marks the spot. Again, we don't have a lot of time to go into the mathematics of this, but suffice it to say that when those two images cross, you have your location, you have your spatial location. So we're in the middle of doing a project using that technology. We're also working with uh, the technology to do sidewalk surveys. And this is yet another piece of software that we use in the office to burn through the images that we collected in the field. And so you can start to get the picture that having photos is one thing, having GIS is another, but when you marry those two technologies and bring them together in a, in a, in a, in a way that, that makes sense in the office, all of a sudden you can leverage the hell out of this stuff and really get some good things going for, for uh, your, yourself and your clients. Yeah, I, I see this uh, slide here, Phil, and I immediately start thinking ADA work, right? So uh, measuring um, sidewalks for American disabilities, um, uh, trans or transportation uh, plans or transition plans, knowing, you know, where all of these assets are along the sidewalk. Super, super neat. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah. let me, I don't, are we done? Are we heard oh. on time? No, we, we've got a few more minutes. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I just I just wanted to point out, Nick, that that in addition to collecting assets in this particular uh, project here, you can see that what we're doing is pulling off distresses. So we're gathering things like faults in the concrete, like trip hazards, uh, cracks, uh, any other deficiencies, the spalling of the concrete. So you can you can see that that while that's traditionally something that's done in the field, you know, the high accuracy of locations and the um, high resolution photos now just bring us the, the capability to do this in the office. Oh, that's awesome. All right, so let's go ahead and kind of start wrapping this up. Let's take a look at what we were talking about and we'll do a little bit of analysis. Uh, so the first thing that Phil's team was doing was going out and collecting the raw field points then editing in the Esri ecosystem to actually make a network, uh, and then deployment of the data in the EMS web map, uh, a better GIS by leveraging the best in breed software and GNSS technology. So again, I wanna just throw this out there that Phil and his team did his due diligence understanding what high accuracy GNSS means, understanding not only coordinate systems, but datums, uh, but even beyond that, understanding elevations, whether it's orthometric heights or ellipsoidal, uh, how that Im is impacted by things like geoid models. So if you're going to get into the world of high accuracy uh, field data collection, just please do your due diligence and understand what you're collecting. Uh, this is an example of uh, kind of a common place where the thought of where the location of the object was, was actually not where it ended up being. And so Phil's team was able to take the valve record here on the left-hand side, uh, the GIS and GPS information collected, marry it all together and come up with a good solution. Uh, you can see here kind of another example and we are you know, a little bit uh, short on time, but as Phil mentioned at the beginning, um, the G, the, there was no GIS system you know, beforehand and the, the system they were using before often had a lot of tribal knowledge, a lot of experiential knowledge, paper 
you know, paper maps, uh, maps written on the back of napkins. And it was up to him to get all of this or his firm to get all of these data actually authoritative in the right place with the right attributes, et cetera. Um, again, you can see here that uh, the identification of this process, which I should also mention is super collaborative. Uh, Phil has often daily meetings, if not weekly meeting or weekly meetings, if not daily meetings with his clients uh, and they work through these together. So he mentioned that he did the initial collection, but on the, on the, the but that Cave Creek was also doing collection. And so once he handed over the, the GIS that was ready to roll, he has been working collaboratively with the client ever since, uh, continually updating this. And we know that the moment you collect data, it's, it's outdated, right? And so there's this repetitive process of always massaging and getting new data. So let me read this to you. Um, cost, traditional market research exemplifies that a traditional registered surveyor would charge between $80 and $100 per field collected point. Using this math, the town of Cave Creek estimated that they would have to spend roughly $350,000 to complete this project. However, with EMS's innovative geospatial solution, the project cost dropped to just over $15,000. Now, maybe you didn't need to have a registered surveyor uh, stamp every location, but you get the idea here that with a system on a, on a bike, low cost, um, sustainable, being able to collect so much data so quickly, um, why it was so valuable to the end client. Um, and Phil, I, I, I'd let you kind of wrap up here. I mean, any thoughts on cost or, you know, speed, repeatability? Well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's fair to say that it's, it's hard to, to say if these are hard and fast numbers, but suffice it to say the client uses this data every single day. He has no problem paying that money to us and, uh, and thinks it's well worth it. That's great. We're going to make a quick plug. If you don't listen to podcasts, you probably live underneath a rock. But if you uh, want to know more about this solution, episode 65 of the Geoholics, uh, both Phil and I, we did an interview with the podcasting team, uh, and they interviewed us uh, a little bit more extensively on the ins and outs and the minutia of this project. If you're at all interested, you can find the Geoholics on most podcast uh, prov uh, providers like Spotify, Apple, etc. All right, Phil, in 30 seconds, give us an awesome prophetic declaration. What do you got? <laughs> and those aren't my words, Nick. You always do this. And I, I thought you took prophetic out of there. I don't, I don't feel like a prophet, but I will say this, and I said it in the, uh, in, the, uh, um, in the podcast, is stay in your lane. I really think that, that there's enough experts out there that we don't have to do everything for everybody. I'm, I'm good at what I do. Nick is great at what he does. Let's leverage each other. Let's call out when we need help. Uh, and, and together we can, we can get good solutions for our clients. All right. I thought that was a joke, staying in your lane, riding a bicycle. At any rate, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. This has been a pleasure. We are at our time. I would say this again, if you have any questions about the development, the technologies, the software, the coding, the hardware, phil at emsol.com. He is ready and willing. He loves to talk GIS just like we all do. So thank you so much for Esri putting on this fantastic conference. We love you guys. If you have any questions, please reach out. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye now.